telephone doesn't ring while you're doing this and take it off the hook. We, we have the tapes. Oh, do you? This is November 30th, 1984. My name is Joe Todd, and this is an interview with Mrs. Patty Jean Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y in Oklahoma City. Mrs. Kelly, where were you born? I was born in Honolulu. And when's your birthday? Yeah, you know my age. <laughs> November 25th, 1924. You just had a birthday? Yes. It was a rough one to hit, too. <laughs> Who was your father? My father was Alfred Croft, C-R-O-F-T. And your mother? Selma Bergstrom Croft, B-E-R-G-S-T-R-O-N. Where were your parents from? Uh, my father was born and reared in England. He was from Maidenhead, England. And your mother? And my mother was from, uh, she was born in Chicago. Uh, her uh, parents came over from Sweden, from uh, Helsingborg. Did your parents ever talk of why they came to this country? Uh, my parents, my father, yes, my father, one, he, he knew there, there were a lot of opportunities over here. And so he left uh, England at the age of 20 and came to uh, to the United States. What year was that? I would say it was, um, well, it's probably around 1913. Did you talk about the trip over? No. Which, unfortunately, was too bad. Yeah. Did he come to Ellis Island? I don't know that. I have wondered that myself. And he's deceased now, so... That's another topic that we also... I see. What about your mother? My mother? Mm -hmm. uh, she didn't talk much about it. Of course, she was born in Chicago. Okay. But I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm sure sorry. my grandparents went through Ellis Island. And they came over there because there were so many of their uh, Swedish relatives mm -hmm. that had moved over, and there were opportunities. And was your country. mother related to the Bergstrom of Bergstrom Air Force Base in Austin? Not that I know of. Are you familiar with it? Yes. I know it's an unusual name. Mm -hmm. When were your parents married? My par parents were married in, uh, I just trying to think, it was... Uh, 1919. And did they say why they went to Hawaii? No, my parents, uh, let me, I, I want to say, first of all, my father was a self-taught pilot. And uh, he taught flying in San Antonio during World War I. And he taught, well, one of his students was Frank Cox. He knew Doolittle, he knew a lot of the top, you know, ace pilots. And Billy Mitchell? Yes, he knew them all, and I don't remember how many of these people he taught, but he used to talk about it when I was a child. Any specific stories that he would tell you about teaching flying and sanitizing? No, not too many. Was he there at is it Randolph or Brooks? Was it, wasn't there a Kelly field? Okay. I think it was yeah, the Kelly. Was I think that's where he was. Uh -huh. That's right. Are you related to the Kelly? No. <laughs> no, that's my married name. No, I'm not, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, and then, um, when the war was over, my father had an opportunity to go to the Philippines with uh, Curtis Airplane Company to represent the company. Actually, if he had stayed in this country, I think he could have done what Lindbergh did because he went out there as a young man and uh, he made the first inner island trip flying around the Philippines. Then my mother uh, had graduated from nursing school in Oakland, California. And she had, one of her classmates had uh, um, gone out to Manila with the Episcopal Church. She's a registered nurse. 
and uh, she begged my mother to come out there because they needed private duty nurses. So mother ventured out there on her own, and she met my father there, and uh, they were married in Manila. Where did your mother go to school? I believe it was East Bay Nursing School. Uh, I'm not sure whether, I think that's joined in with um, Merrick Nursing School, the hospital over there now. Let me back up one moment. You said that your father was a self-taught pilot. Mm -hmm. At that time, there weren't that many airplanes around. No, So where no, did no. he learn? In New York. In New, New York. York. Did he work, was he in the Army in World War I teaching flying, or was he a Yes. Student? No, he was in the he Army. He was in the Army. Mm -hmm. And after the Philippines, when did your parents go to Hawaii? Well, first of all, my parents went to China. And my father was asked to go to Canton to teach flying for Sun Yat-sen. he talk about Sun Yat-sen? No, he re well, if he did, I don't remember. They talked, my parents would talk a lot about Chinese, the Chinese people, but, you know, there were so many other things that happened in our life that, you know, you just sort of put those in the back of your mind, you don't think about them. Wasn't Sun Yat-sen a doctor? Didn't he have a PhD? I believe he did. Because I've heard people refer to him as Dr. Sun Yat-sen. Yes, yes. PhD. How long did they stay in China? They stayed there two years, and uh, then my mother uh, went back to this to California because my older brother was born, and from there they went on over to Honolulu, and they were just there a short time when I was born, but then they went back out to Manila. And then my father was, uh, and then I, my other brother was born. But uh, my father then was teaching flying for the Philippine Constabulary. So were you raised in the Philippines? Yes. Can you describe, let me see, did you live in Manila? Yes. Okay. Could you describe Manila from a young girl's point of view? Well, it was really the Pearl of the Orient. That's what everyone called it. They, uh, it really was a beautiful place before the war. We, uh, unfortunately, it was a bad place to be reared because, you know, we always had so many servants and it was kind of hard for a child, you know, to grow up that way. Uh, well, conditions were different. It was a very lazy life. Um, uh, men, I don't know, they they would work different hours, they had their siestas and all this business in it, so, well, it was an easy life, very easy. And how long were you in Manila? 19 years. 19 years. From 1924 until? Well, 1925 to 45. Well, actually, I guess it's about, well, it was close to well, it was 19 years. Did the Great Depression affect the Philippines? No. No. Well, how come? I don't know. I, I often thought about that because I used to, as a child, I'd hear all the stories about the food lines and all that. No, we didn't have it. Hmm. It was strange. Everybody lived rather high out there, you know? Was, high there, was there any apprehension when Japan started their expansion? Middle 30s? Yes, there was. Tell me about it. Not, not really, just a whole lot. People couldn't believe it, but you know, we always used to worry about the fact that they were buying all the steel, you know, scraps and everything. Uh, they really didn't think too much about it till just before the war started. Uh, the uh, military people got their um, families, the mothers, you know, the women and children out of uh, Manila, but that was just just barely before the war started. But the, other than that, they didn't seem to. They would talk about uh, things that, you know, they would say, well, 
you know, if anything happens, we'll have the women and children all come civilians to Corregidor. And, well, we never did even begin to see the place. <laughs> but there was a certain amount of apprehension, but not very much. Were you aware of what was going on in Manchuria? Yes. In yes. But there again, I was a child, and I really didn't think much about it. My parents would have been more aware of it. Okay. What were you doing on December 7th? December 8th? 8th over there. Okay. I have a hard time keeping that straight. Um, well, I, I was awakened at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning, and my mother had had a call from the editor of Manila Bulletin saying that war was declared and that uh, we would have to, uh, you know, be prepared that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor and that, uh, you know, they would be coming in Manila. And, of course, I was told that time to get up and go to school because I was in high school then. And uh, at that time, we thought that, you know, uh, we didn't think that Manila would be attacked that quick. Actually, it wasn't uh, till the next day that Manila was attacked, but the uh, planes came over and uh, bombed Clark Field, which is, um, oh, I would say about 100 miles north of Manila, and got 60 planes on the ground, and we knew that we were in trouble. So, um, actually, tried to carry on the best we could, but, you know, of course, we didn't have a normal life after that. It was one air raid after the other. Uh, that was when uh, there were so many casualties from that bombing in Clark Field that they, uh, the Army called my mother. They called all registered nurses that they knew, put on their uniforms, and come to the hospital to take care of the casualties. What part of the middle did you live in? Uh, it was close to Nichols Field. Uh, it was the south part of Manila. Was Nichols Field attacked? Yes, it was attacked. What were your feelings during the air raids, the bombings? Um, what was your reaction during the air raids? What were your feelings? Well, I was afraid that, you know, a bomb would hit us most any time. I, I just couldn't believe it was all true. That I, I just wondered how in the world we would ever get out of there. Uh, at that time, they were burning uh, the, um, the all the uh, boats at the yacht club there in Manila, and uh, they were trying who to was, keep who was burning? the uh, the uh, I guess the government people. Okay. Well, because. They were wanting to uh, keep people from uh, the Japanese. See, Manila was declared an open city in order to prevent the city from being destroyed. Then the Japanese decided, uh, I mean, the Japanese were about to come into Manila. And uh, so they thought the Japanese would get these boats and try to get on over to Corregidor. So at that time, my family had thought that you know, they would buy one of the one of the yalls, and we try to escape to Australia. But uh, they decided that time we had ten on board, and Christmas Eve, uh, some of the people backed out. Now we backed out, and there were two other of the uh, boats that went on, and one was picked up in Sandak in the northern part of uh, Borneo, and these people were taken prisoners there. The other one had some men on board, and they were picked up in Lady and beheaded. So who knows where we would have been. So. How did your lifestyle change after the air raid started? Oh, well, we just didn't have much of a life. It, I mean, you just never knew you were on attention. Uh, uh, my, actually, my younger brother and I were at home most of the time by ourselves with the servants because you know, the family. My parents were gone. And, what was your and father so, doing during this time? Uh, my father would go back and forth to the office. And he was still working for the constabulary? No, no. He was then with uh, the General Motors. Okay. When did you realize the Japanese 
had landed and were coming to Manila. Oh, actually, just a few days after war started, they had landed in the northern part of Luzon. Actually, I was in the area just bef the Sunday before um, they landed. And it was just a few days after that they were there on the beach. And uh, it was shortly after that that, you know, they moved into Manila because of being an open city. See, all the troops pulled out and went on to uh, Corregidor and Batan. Did the Japanese respect Manila being an open city? Yes. They, did. They, they finally did. For a while they did, and they kept on bombing. But that was the only way they felt they could save the city. When was the first time you saw the Japanese? I remember, um, well, it was right after Christmas. Would you tell me about that Christmas? How'd you celebrate Christmas 1941? Well, it was, uh, it was, uh, well, we really didn't really celebrate. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have a tree, we didn't have any presents or, you know, it just wasn't anything. It was just like another day to me. Prior to that time, I guess you, did you celebrate the other Christmases? Oh, absolutely. It was, I be sure, a happy time. When you saw the Japanese, what did you think? Well, I just knew we, we, we had had it. You know, I just didn't know whether we, you know, lived from one day to the other. And what were the Japanese reactions to you all? And what did they do to you? Oh, just, you know, shoving their bayonets and making these awful noises at you and, you know, pushing you around. You just knew to respect those guns. Now, did they come to your home? Or? When they came to Gadash, yes. They came in a truck and um, with their soldiers and bayonets and asked us to take enough uh, food and clothing with us for three days in an overnight bag, and that doesn't give you much. You just lock your house up and off you go. Did, uh, was this an intentional rounding up of all the Americans? Yes. In the Philippines? Yes. How did they know where you were located? They had our addresses. Where did they get I don't know. I guess from the, wouldn't you imagine, the American Embassy? Possibly. Mm -hmm. All the, you know, all the um, Americans and British, French, were picked up. After they picked you up in the truck, what happened? They took us on to uh, this one area uh, and uh, checked us all out. It was a stadium close by, close to where we lived, and then they took us on over to Santa Tomas. And um, we were eventually assigned a place to sleep, which was on the floor, concrete floor. What day did they pick you up? The, the, the 6th of January, 1942. You said you were assigned a place. Is that to right? Sleep. If, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you said you were assigned a place to sleep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Was it in one of the buildings? Yes, in the main building. In the main this building. was, you know, a university. Right. And it's a large building. You know, I was going to bring some photographs, and I forgot it. I have a book, the first cabin, World War Two, oh, and they do? have photographs of Santa Tomas in the book. For heaven's sakes. And I was going to bring it, and I forgot it. Oh, I'd like to so see it. It's up at the office. Um, what were your, of course you said you were sleeping on the floor, what were your living quarters like in Santa Tomas? Well, I tell you, we eventually, okay, we eventually were able to get some wooden beds and a little mattress to put on top. They eventually got us, the Red Cross got us this. Uh, we had, um, generally speaking, we had maybe 40 in a room. Of course, the men and women were completely separate. How large were the rooms? 40 to a room? Well, 
Not very large. I mean, larger than this room we're in. Okay, what? 40 by 20 feet? Yes, like they varied, you know, because these were classrooms. Right. They vary in sizes. But we would have, um, our bed would just be, say, 36 inches. Well, just a, an average single bed. Then you'd have just a, a certain maybe 30 inches for aisle space. And then there's another bed, and that's the way we were all stacked up. And our, our belongings were in a suitcase underneath the bed. And um, so we were just all jammed in those rooms. What about the guards? The guards, they would watch us pretty close. And were the guards inside the in, university? Yes, inside. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, they patrol the rooms. They delighted in coming. I was put eventually put up on the third floor because being young, a teenager, they thought, you know, it would be better to put the younger ones up there where we could climb the stairs so many times a day. We really stayed and fed up and doing all that. But anyway, these guards would uh, really delight in coming into our rooms. You know, the girls, where the young girls were. Right. And walking around at night. You know, it just would scare you. Just never knew what was going to happen. Were you mistreated by the Japanese? No, not physically. Just mentally. What would they do mentally? Mentally, well, they would tell us things like, uh, you know, think that we were going to be taken someplace or, or uh, you know, that they, we weren't going to have any food. It's like the Commandant said to us, while we are victorious, we can afford to be generous. And each time that we would, uh, they would take another island. Then they would, the Americans would, then they would clamp down on us. At first, at the very beginning, you know, they were freer with their food and all. And, um, but after that, no. They got to the point that they really started starving. What did your food consist of? Well, mostly rice. And uh, we'd have a little meat in it and little vegetables, but we went to horse meat. Uh, and at the point, at the, at the very end, we were eating, uh, we were eating uh, just things like weeds, pigweed. You'd be surprised how good pigweed is. <laughs> and, uh, they would, they cut us down so that uh, eventually they would give us, remember the little GI butter can? They'd give us one of those a day and they would have the husk on it. So we would have to take the husk off some way and then find a little firewood to try to cook this. I mean, it was really starvation. But, you know, this is the way it was. Uh, I was talking to Virginia in Texas. She said that for the first few weeks, they didn't receive any food at all, the Japanese. But they received food from the Filipinos. That's right. That's right. Tell me about that. Uh, yes, they had, they had the, uh, at the front gate, they would allow people to come in with packages. And if you had, didn't have any outside connections, you couldn't get any food. That they would bring different things in. And that's why some of us were able to get different things through uh, that, uh, you know, from our homes, if they had a chance to go in there and get them. I have friends they were able to save quite a few things. We didn't save any things. Thing, you know, one thing I was able to get through was I used to play the accordion, and uh, some fella, he didn't send it through the gate. He got it over the fence some way to me, my accordion. So I was able to play the accordion, and we had these uh, floor shows in camp just to keep people, you know, minds, their minds active and all. And uh, so I, they would ask me to play in that bar show every now and then. And it's just something to keep you from going, losing your mind, you know. What songs did you play? Oh, Barrel Barrel Polka. And in fact, I played that at the uh, first gallery for this first camp group with their orchestra when they came into Montalupa. Tell me, or describe your average day in Santa Tomas. What would you do? My average day was... From the time you got up until you went to bed. Okay. Every day, we had, we had to have uh, our, do our 
we were assigned jobs. I did, was able to get a job, fortunately, in the main kitchen. We served two meals a day. At the very beginning we had three, but then it cut us down to two. And I would do the serving uh, during, you know, at that time. Now, there were, and then I would work in the garden. We'd grow vegetables, I'd do that. Then we also, I graduated from high school in that camp. Because you see, our school year started differently. It started in June and ended in March. So if the war had been declared a few months later, I wouldn't have been caught there. I'd been back in college. So anyway, they let me, our group, go ahead. They were able to get some books, and they let us finish our high school. And then we had um, all different professors in there, and we had access to some of those uh, books in there, so we were able to take different courses, you know, that kept us busy. But, uh, oh, just do things with my friends. There wasn't much to do, believe me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really. Were your parents in there also? Yes. Okay. But we were separated for, for a long time. Uh, we were separated over a year. What time would the Japanese get you up in the morning? Oh, about 6 o'clock. Would they have like a reveille? Well, yes, we had 7 o'clock roll call every morning. And, a, and also a 5 o'clock roll call. When did you eat? How many meals a day did you have? We actually, majority of the time, we just had two meals a day. You know, I wished I could answer that question, but I can't. And, I, and to uh, go check it on the file, they would give me the whole area, which we we didn't have the whole area. We were fenced off part of it. Yeah, there's a big wall but around, isn't there? Big wall around it. Is that the area that you had? Yes. Uh huh. But we didn't have the total amount. The church was fenced off from our group. Now you said you had a garden. Yes, we had a little area to have a garden. Uh -huh. Was this inside the big wall? Inside the big wall, uh -huh, where we grew vegetables. I, I have to tell you an interesting story, because so many people will ask me about this. And um, one time when it was, well, Thanksgiving was coming, um, this, well, we all built little, little shacks away from the building. You know, if we could get enough material, it would be a little shack, just to get away from the people. Well, there happened to be some pumpkins growing around the shack area, and this man um, asked if um, he, he was one of the fellows that drove the guards in and out to pick up their food supplies. He said to my mother, he said, well, you know, he said, would you, um, he says, you've got those pumpkins growing around, and, and Thanksgiving is coming pretty soon. Do you think if I would get two eggs and some brown sugar that you could come up with the rest of the ingredients to make a pumpkin pie. And my mother said, well, I don't know, George. He said, I think that I'll see what I can do. And I said, well, Mother, we can grind the cassava roots up and make flour out of it. And then I said, um, we can uh, get a coconut some way. We'll find a coconut and uh, grate that. And then I'll squeeze it and make the milk for the pie. And, but our biggest problem was what we were going to do for lard, for that uh, crust. So I said, well, Mother, I said, there wasn't any way we could get this. So I said, we each have a jar of abilene cold cream, and it's unscented, in our Red Cross kit, because we only got one Red Cross kit. We got a half a British and half a Canadian also in three years. And I said, you know, I said, maybe... Since I'm younger, I don't need that cold cream as much as you do. So I said, I'll give you my cold cream, and we'll use that for the crust. Well, anyway, we we got this all together, and we got all of a little charcoal stove and a, and a Dutch oven inverted the top, made that pie, put the coals up on that top. My goodness, that was a marvelous pie. I've often thought about writing Abilene cold cream and telling them about it. You should. <laughs> I should. I just thought I'd tell you that because that was kind of interesting. That is. How much was the garden a major?
major food source? No. 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 We didn't have that much ground. Now, you were captured January 6th, you taken prisoner. Yes. Now, are the winters bad in the Philippines? No, it's warm all the time. We have the, uh, you know, the typhoon season. Mm -hmm. There, we have the hot season. Chris, so, we, you were, you got up 6 o'clock in the morning, had roll call. Mm -hmm. After roll call, what would you do? I would, you know, serve the food. And uh, then, you know, I would go to school or whatever I had going, you know, work in the garden. And, uh, Who cooked the food? Uh, it, we cooked it in the main kitchen. Uh, the in, the in, uh, prisoners did. Okay, so you used the kitchen there? And oh, cooked yes, the we cooked our own food. Okay. And uh, when it got, things got pretty meager, people would even get in, in line for the Japanese soldiers garbage. I never stood that low. <laughs> but they did. How many people were placed in San Tomas? There were a little over 6,000. And they were all civilians? Yes. Also, no, they weren't. I must correct myself. I, I think there were about 20 Navy nurses and there were 70 Army nurses from Corregidor. How long after you were taken prisoner that Corregidor fell? I believe it probably was around five months, maybe four months. Kind of hard to remember whether it was Batan or Corregidor. Well, Batan fell first. Now, Corregidor is the island, isn't it? Yes. And Batan is a peninsula. peninsula. Mm -hmm. What was the reaction of the Japanese when Botanic Regidor fell? Well, that's when they started becoming very ugly. They started clamping down on our privileges and on our food. When you say privileges, what kind of privileges? Well, there were some people, you know, that were able to uh, work to get passes to go in and out, you know, those that had family and all could. I couldn't go out, but, um, and I didn't care to go out. But uh, there were some people that did, and um, I, well, just, and they took away anybody sending anything in to us, those privileges. They just cut down on everything. Mm -hmm. And they'd make us turn the lights off earlier at night, and just, you know, like anything they want to do to be a little mean. So in the beginning, people were coming and going in and out of Santa Tomas? Oh, no, not, not coming and going. No, there were, you had to have a pass, and it was a real thing, real treat to get a pass. You, well, you had to be ill. For instance, my younger brother, he was taken out. He became very ill, and he, they had to take him out to a hospital outside. And my mother was allowed to go out to see him. So it had to be something like that to get yes, a pass. Yes, yes. Okay. Or, you know, say the elderly mm -hmm. would sometimes be able to go out and live outside for a while. Now, I will say, the uh, missionaries were allowed to leave the camp. They signed an agreement with the Japanese that they would not uh, molest the Japanese in any way, and they would do their missionary work with their churches and all. Well. Not all of them did this. Some people stayed in because they felt like we needed them, but majority of them went out. Then finally, before the war ended, and I was up in the other camp of Los Banos, they were all brought in there before I went up to this camp and put in barracks. And of course, it uh, didn't seem right to me that they were allowed to get food in. But they got food in about once a week from there churches outside, but they wouldn't share it with us. They wouldn't. They wouldn't share it. And I, I feel very badly about it. I feel sort of resentful that they did do this because uh, being in the barracks with them, I think there were only four of us in there were not missionaries and there were 96 in that barracks, that by golly, uh, they would sit there in front of me and eat food. Uh, well, what they had was rice and peanuts. But I didn't have either one of them. 
and I would be so weak that when I would get up, I would have to hold on to something because I had to start a very, very. And um, I would hold on to something or I'd fall over. Well, it wasn't right that, to me that they didn't share this. But of course, I realized if they shared it with me, they'd have to share it with other people. But at night, there were children that would be crying it, and they couldn't, they couldn't sleep because of hunger. And I felt like the Christian thing to do was to put that food in the central kitchen and share it with everyone. As it is, when the troops came in, set the barracks on fire, the food was all burned up. So it didn't do anybody any good to hoard it. <laughs> so Now they set the barracks on fire. Yes. I, I didn't know whether I didn't want to be jumping into that. I didn't know whether there were other questions you wanted sure. to ask me prior to um, Tell me about burning the barracks. What? Oh, this, um, you see, as you well know, the first cab went to Santa Tomas. But I, I was rescued because our family was separated and mother and I were in Santa Tomas, and, and so she said, well, I think this will be our last chance, this was in December of 44, to get the family together and we ought to go to Las Banas. So they transferred us, they transferred just so many people up there, and uh, we were still in captivity when um, uh, uh, Santa Tomas was released and liberated, and so anyway, they, um, we were liberated the 23rd of February. That was, um, we were supposed to, so we've been told, and we have people to verify this, that uh, we were supposed to be machine gunned that morning at the seven o'clock roll call. And that is the reason that MacArthur sent the troops behind the front lines to get us. I have become acquainted with quite a few of the airborne people. I also went out on a trip with the airborne group to Manila uh, about four years ago. And I met, there were two fellows on the trip that had liberated. They had jumped with the group into the camp. And I, they, along with the um, Philippine guerrillas, all explained to me that they found the machine guns there. And they did tell me that we were to be machine gunned that morning. So. That is the reason why they came in. The uh, airborne group came in at 7 o'clock, right on the dot, just as we were getting all headed for our roll call in front of the barracks, which we had to do morning and evening, as I mentioned before. We had to line up, and then the Japanese would count us. We had to bow to them. And uh, before we got in line, the the uh, C-47s came over with the paratroopers, the Filipino guerrillas hit, and then that amphibious tank group all hit at one time. Now, there was recently this amphibious group that was here for their reunion. One of the fellows told me the reason they burned the barracks is, was to get the people, prisoners out of there and in to the tanks because they had just so many minutes to get us out before the Japanese would have really hit. Yeah. And, but I was, I was told it was to burn the Japanese out, no, so, but I believe the amphibious group. You familiar with the flying column? No, what, the what first is that? Have. Yes, I've heard of it. Okay, uh, I talked to people that were on the flying column and MacArthur ordered the first cab to Santa Tomas because yes. they were afraid yep. the Japanese would kill the prisoners. That's true. Well, okay, that's that's right. I forgot it was called a flying column because my and husband was in this. He was. Mm -hmm. We talked. I've talked to several people. And they said they got lost in Manila, and they even met a Japanese tank column. Oh my goodness! And it was at night. The Japanese thought that they were Japanese tanks. Stopped and then across. Oh my goodness! I had heard that. And uh, they said that they just went straight through. Didn't know where they were. And I talked to Virginia, and she said they heard this noise outside. Mm -hmm. And she weren't sure. She wasn't sure if they were Japanese or Americans. If you'd excuse, excuse the expression, mm -hmm. she heard this voice say, "Where in the hell is the goddamn gate?" <laughs> then, <laughs> she knew, just like them. <laughs> then she knew. Then she knew they were Americans. And about that time, a tank crashed the gate. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. I heard that. Right. Well, that that is wonderful. Mm -hmm. 
And you know that there were several fellows on that team that, with that group that were former Philippine, well, they'd been reared in the Philippines, and they had gone to my school that I knew that were on that, in that group. Mm -hmm. um, the flag. My mother had it. Which flag is that? The American flag. That was flying? That was raised in the camp. I, well, oh, you going back to yeah. your trend of thought. Mm -hmm. Go back to your deal. Um, okay. You had roll call at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. That sounds like your mm -hmm. boss. At what time did you go to bed? Well, went to bed generally around nine. Mm -hmm. What about shower facilities? Oh, that was miserable. <laughs> we just had shower heads open, nothing enclosed. Nothing enclosed. Now the to uh, the toilet area was enclosed in sections, but the showers were all open, and it was strictly women. But I mean, it was in a room. But the Japanese soldiers would delight in coming in and watching the women taking their showers. That's why I said it was miserable. <laughs> so you had good sanitation facilities? Pretty good. Not, not just real good. Up in Los Banos it was more like the country, you know, yeah. the outdoor privy. Mm -hmm. And how long were you in Santo Tomas? Actually, three years, just about three years, not quite three years. What was the death rate inside the prison? Well, that, that's hard to tell because at the beginning, it was uh, not uh, not too bad. But later on, you know, as people became weaker, malnutrition, you're more susceptible to death. And uh, towards the end, well, we'd have several die during the day. We was getting to the point that, well, we didn't even have sheets to wrap them in, you know, to bury them. Where were they buried? Where was the cemetery? They would take them outside. In, in Santa Tomas, they took them outside. They had an area there in the other camp there where they would bury them, but we were too far from the mill. Mm -hmm. And so did the Japanese allow you all to dig the graves, and where did the... Yes. Um, no, not not generally speaking. The only ones they allowed to dig the grave were the three men that escaped, and uh, they were caught, and they were brought back into the camp and beaten severely. Then they were taken out. They dug their own graves, and then they were buried before they were dead. So. They were buried alive then. Right. hard to imagine, isn't it? Yeah. It all seems like a bad dream to me at times. Mm -hmm. So what would you do with the dead? You just take them out, outside? And outside. Mm -hmm. And uh, bury them. How far from Santa Tomas was the area that you buried them? Uh, oh, I would say two, three miles. Mm -hmm. Was it a regular cemetery? Regular cemetery. Okay. But they did lay big graves for them, the dead? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, you know, not having gone out there to see him, yeah. see the area, I, I'm not sure, but I know they're in Las Banos, they dug him. Mm -hmm. Was there a regular funeral detail? Funeral? Yeah. I mean, did they have certain people that would take the dead out, or just, who took the dead outside? No, the Japanese went. The Japanese took mm -hmm. them out? Okay. Families didn't go. They didn't? No. Now, at the beginning, they were allowed to, but not, not later. No, because I remember seeing one of my best friend's mother go out on a little buggy pulled by a horse, and it just really tore me out. Um, how come the Japanese changed their attitude? If they, you, know, they, you said they, they took away your privileges, and was it because of they were losing the war? The they were island? losing, yes. They were losing the islands. You know, uh, well, I'm talking about Solomon's and in that area, you know, as they started moving closer to the Philippines, I think they realized more that they had to. Were you receiving any news at all? Oh, yes. Goodness, Wes, we had a, we'd have uh, transcripts thrown over quite often, thrown over the wall. 
Or by the Philippines? Yes. By the Philippines? Mm -hmm. Right. So you knew how the war was going? We knew. But, you know, it wasn't always true, everything we'd hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fortunately we did. You know, every time uh, you tell somebody something and it passes on, I can remember having a little brownie troop and we'd play the game sitting in a circle and say something, pass right. it around the room, right. it comes out entirely different. Mm -hmm. And that's the way this our news was. And that's why we do this program. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. To get from the people that we live. I see. Mm -hmm. um, tell me again why you left Santa Tomas and went to the other camp. It's because my father and brother were transferred. They took all the uh, men, younger men, and um, uh, males up to the other camp. They were going to build this camp and transfer us all out to that camp. Everyone? But everyone. But they never were able to complete it entirely. And what was so the name of that camp? Las Banos. B-A-N-A-O-S. And when did you leave Santa Tomas for Los Banos? Uh, in the latter part of December in 44. How did you travel? We traveled on a, the, on a truck to the train and then put us in boxcars and then took us up to the town of Las Vinos and from there we had to walk up to the camp. So how far is this from Manila? Well, I would say about 40 miles. 40 miles? Mm -hmm. But they got us uh, uh, on that thing at 3 in the morning. <laughs> we didn't get there till afternoon, so it was kind of a horrible trip. Yeah. Uh, December 44, okay, the uh, Americans hadn't landed yet, had they, in the Philippines? Yeah, September, December 44, yeah. oh yes. Oh, they had? Yeah, well, they were in, in Lady. Okay. They were in Lady, and you know, I can't remember exactly when they married, uh, they landed on the Alamo of Luzon, but I would say, I would say it'd be in January. Yeah. You know, I work at the First Cab Museum at Fort Hood, and That'd we have on display an American flag that when the First Cab landed, like the Philippine guerrillas were flying this flag. Is that right? And mm -hmm. uh, when the Japanese took the Philippines, it was a group of American soldiers just knelt it into the jungle with the guerrillas. And they gave the guerrillas this American flag. I'll be done. That's and, interesting. And uh, when uh, the first cab landed, they had this flag flying. And I talked to people, they said it was strange to land in the Philippines with an American flag flying. Well, that's that's great. And uh, they gave the flag to the first cab to the commander, General Chase. And I they requested that this flag fly in Tokyo. So for one day, that flag flew over the Japanese embassy in Tokyo. I have met General Chase. Mm -hmm. He was on a cruise. Is with he still me. living? Well, he was a couple of years ago. Uh, I, I saw him in A1 at Fort Hood. I wished, in fact, I have a uh, photograph made of myself with him. So he was the uh, leader of the flying column. Yes. That's when he was still a one star. He was assistant division that, commander at that time. Is that right? Yeah. That'd be an interesting place to, mm -hmm. to see that museum. Okay. When did you realize that you were being rescued at Los Banos? Well, when I saw the paratroopers <laughs> come and drop the angels from heaven. Uh, I, I knew that it was going to happen shortly because, uh, you know, we were at the point that anything we had in the way of jewelry, which we would have to hide, we'd trade for food, and my mother was going to, to uh, trade this ring that she had kept hidden in her engagement ring, and I said, Mother, I have a feeling the troops are coming in, but I tell you what, I've got my watch here and I'll and a ring, and I said, I'll, cha I'll trade this first, and I'll do the watch first, but I feel the troops are going to be in because the sky looks so red from a distance, and you could hear the rumbles. Well, that's when we knew we were going to, uh, you know, be rescued shortly. But I didn't tell you the story about this flag that I have. Yeah. 
uh, this was prior to our release is the reason I was bringing it up. Um, one day we all got up and the Japanese troops were not there. Now we heard, kept hearing the rumbles. It sounded like a lot of machine guns. I found out later that the Americans were sending in some PT boats on the other side of the island and, you know, uh, gunning the place pretty bad. And Japanese fell like the Americans were about to land on that side of the island. So they very hurriedly moved out of our camp, moved all the troops out. And so anyway, we were left free, but yet we were afraid to go out because we didn't know whether it was a trap. Well, anyway, this, this went on for three days. And uh, so they said, well, does anybody have a flag? And you know, my mother, had an American flag hidden in her mattress all this time. It was a flag that my father had saved from a carnival that was burning in Manila. And uh, General Wood presented this to my father way back in the 20s. And my mother always treasured the flag. And, I, and so anyway, she came forth with the flag. And we raised that flag. And someone had a British flag. We raised that. And you know that three days later, here came the troops. And uh, so anyway, they proceeded to look for the flags. And this man that had taken the flag hadn't returned it to my mother, fortunately, because they had an inkling it was in our barracks. And they completely searched that at the place. And well, if my mother had been caught with it, we would have been killed without a doubt. I don't know why she took those chances. So in any event, my we have the flag. I have the flag. The flag's already been on three caskets. Even though it has 48 stars, it hasn't bothered me. But anyway, I kept the flag. I offered it. We offered it to uh, MacArthur Museum, but um, Gene MacArthur said they had enough flags over there at that museum. They didn't need it, and I've offered it. I might give it to the Airborne unit when they get their museum together. So anyway, that was the story of the flag that I, I meant to bring up to you. What size flag is it? Oh, it's quite large. It's quite large. It's one that uh, would fly, you know, from tall, real huge pole. Is it a three by five, four by six? Or? Probably about four by six. Four by six. I've got it folded up here yeah. in the closet. Mm -hmm. So you were rescued February 23rd, 1945. Yes. Mm -hmm. On the way to roll call, the 11th Airborne. Uh, you know, these planes just came and these paratroopers dropped out. And that's when the machine gun started. Now, had the Japanese returned? The Japanese had returned. Okay. And been there about a couple of weeks or more before we were rescued. Okay, and that when... I'm confused of when you raised the flag, the American flag. Did it ask the Japanese had left to go to the PT boats? Yes, had gone to this other area, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then you raised the American flag? Yes. Then the Japanese returned? The Japanese returned. Fortunately, the flag was down. Okay. Returned turned during the night. Okay, you knew the Japanese were coming back then? No, we didn't. We didn't know what to expect. Why did you take the flag down? Well, just they took it down every night. Okay. And they returned during the night. But they evidently had an inkling that there, they knew there was a flag. There were two flags raised. Mm -hmm. And the man that took the flag down did return it to your mother? That's right. Did, did the Japanese find the flag? Uh, no, they never did. Okay. That's the reason I have it. Mm -hmm. How come I didn't find it? Um, well, because it wasn't returned to my mother. He, they didn't go to all the other barracks. There were a lot of barracks there to go through, and they didn't. And so, when did your mother get the flag back? Uh, before the troops came in. Yeah. Okay. What was the first thing you did when the American came in? Well, well the first time I saw that uh, GI come down the hall, I 
I just grabbed him. I said, are you a Marine? <laughs> and he said, heavens no, I'm a paratrooper. And I said, well, I've been waiting for the Marines all these years. <laughs> but I just grabbed him. That's the most beautiful thing. But, of course, when the troops, you know, when they started firing, of course, we all scattered. I ran back to the barracks and crawled under the bed. And I was in this little cubicle with my mother and I were with these um, Catholic nuns. And they were going through the rosary. But, and, um, you know, we were just praying a lot hoping that we wouldn't be killed. We just didn't know what to expect. So then, all these soldiers came in and said, get your belongings and get in these amphibian tanks. You have five minutes. Well, I didn't have any clothes to mount to anything, so I just took my accordion and off I went. What kind of clothes were you wearing? What did the Japanese give you? They didn't give us anything. That was the problem. We'd have to kind of share. I only had one real outfit that I had to wear, and that was a khaki skirt and a cotton blouse. And see, we didn't have anything to iron. We didn't have irons. They took the irons away from us. So, you know, we, we didn't care what you looked like. Was there a large firefight inside the prison between the Japanese and the paratroopers? There wasn't too much. But you said there was firing. There, what? Firing? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. They kill people. They kill the Japanese. Okay. All of them were there. The Jap They caught the Japanese while they were doing their calisthenics. And that's how they caught so many of them in one spot that they were able to kill. But they didn't know where the others were. That's the reason I thought they set the barracks on fire. So the paratroopers had word that you that you were going to be machine gunned. Right. Any idea how they received that word? Yes, we had. Um, well, through uh, we had some fellows escape from the camp, that and came back in, but uh, they had gotten word through the Philippine guerrillas. Now some people in camp, I understand, knew this. I didn't know it. Of course, it's something they wouldn't spread around because it would cause panic. So you were placed in the amphibious tanks? Yes. And what happened then? Then we were we were taken out and taken down this river with these these planes, you know, firing and firing from the sides from the Japanese through the front lines on down to a beachhead where they had trucks come and they put us in these trucks and then took us off to what they call the new Montalupit prison and that's where they actually had Filipino prisoners but at that time um, uh, they had cleared some of the barrack you know some of the prisons out so they could put us in there where they kept us till uh, May before they shipped us home. Now, the special cases went first. What do you mean special cases? Well, I'm talking about people, you know, that were ill, that were able to travel. They needed to get back home. Some of the older people went first, or some of the very young, you know. But in my situation, I didn't get home till May. How okay. come? Because... Uh, they felt like, um, well, they had to get the ships, plus they wanted to get us, uh, you know, in better condition to travel on the ship. Some people were able to fly out. Did you see any of the Battle of Manila? No. Because it was pretty well destroyed. Yes, I know it was. I Oh, yes, I did get down, but I didn't see any fighting. Yes, I got down. I uh, sometimes would sort of uh, disguise myself as a army nurse or Red Cross worker, and I go down with some of the fellas and go down into Manila, go wait to, to Santa Tomas to see my friends, just for the day. And it, it was really taking a lot of chances because there were snipers along the road, and there were a lot of the roads that were mined and all, and uh, now that I think about it, I was surprised. 
that my mother would let me do those things. Do you carry the status as a former POW? No, actually they call us internees. So but a lot of, ma but majority of the people refer to us as POWs. We're not, we're actually prisoners of war. We certainly didn't get the same pay they did. <laughs> they got back pay. I got a dollar a day to the age of 18 and two dollars a day after. So it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I've seen the license plates on the cars in the form of POW. Fortunately, I was, I, I have one and fortunately, good, thanks to um, Governor Nye and, and um, I see D John McCune, he was the one that helped get this through for us. There are only, I think, two or three civilian prisoners in the state, and they were right there. they allow us to have these tanks. Who are the other prisoners? And there is one fellow here, and I, uh, I can't recall his name. I would have to try to find that. Uh, he was just a baby at that time, so he was very small. He doesn't remember much about the war. But he was the one that really got behind us. Now, he works, he uh, spends a lot of his time um, down with the prisoner of war organization here. And uh, I could find out who he is if you were interested. Yeah, I'd like to. Okay. Um, you returned home. When you say home, you mean stateside? Yes. Mm -hmm. California. California. My home was really Manila. Mm -hmm. city, so. I was going to say, when you say mm -hmm. home. My grandparents' uh, home, well, my mother was reared in California, so. But I had a grandfather and I had an aunt and uncle living there, so that's to o in Oakland. And when did you reach stateside? That was in May. May of 45. 45, I don't remember the day. Did your grandparents know that you were in prison? Well, my grandfather was the only one loving then. They knew we were prisoners, but actually even on the, after our liberation, our names were not on the list. They weren't? No. For, I don't know why they were deleted some way. So they didn't know for a long time that we were, you know, even alive. Do you carry any bitterness for the Japanese? Well, yes, I do. Not to young ones, but to older ones, yes. And that, this is something we have to forgive, and I know a lot of people have forgiven it. But I sometimes kind of, well, I think, when I see, oh, all right, when I see my friends here in Oklahoma City that have uh, been able to do so much, and they talk about the oh the fun things they did as a teenager, and um, what they what they did the years I was locked up. I thought, well, you know, isn't that too bad that I just didn't have the opportunities that these my friends did? And if the Japanese hadn't been so greedy. And wanting to, you know, take over that part of the world, that we wouldn't have had all this happen. Mm -hmm. You know, because we tried, we tried to work things out with them, and and I just, I resented, I resented the way they attacked us. I'll put it that way. I thought it was rather two-faced, but. Uh, you mean Pearl Harbor? Right. I resented that, mm -hmm. and I. I, I was just a victim of circumstances. I will say that one one thing, are you changing tapes? Oh, this. No, I said I was a victim of circumstances, but I, I'll say one thing um, that I have learned from the war that my friends haven't learned is, you know, is to be happy for small things. Well, I, we, we just don't know how great it is to go in and out of our front door every morning. We don't, nobody realizes, I mean, I get upset with myself when I gripe, and sometimes I do gripe because we're, no, you know, I'm normal too, but I hope. But uh, it's just that people just, I don't know, they don't, they don't know how they, they how happy they, they should be about the things that they have, their freedom. 
And I hate to hear anybody criticize, you know, our country. And I and I've been to Japan many times. And I'll get along fine. And I have a little gal, a little Filipino girl that uh, comes and helps me at the house, clean the house occasionally here. And uh, she will bring a Japanese girl. Well, this is fine. We get along fine. She doesn't know anything about my past. And I don't care to talk to her about it because, you know, she was young. I was, she wasn't even born. And I was young. So, but I, I feel like I resent the older ones. And uh, I'm sorry I still feel this way, but, uh, and yet, as you can look around my house and see, I have a lot of Japanese things around. I try not to buy too many things <laughs> over there. You said that you rescued a few things from your home. Oh, these two chairs I mentioned? That's the only thing that you rescued? That's right. How did you get them? Oh, my mother found those after the war. Where were they? In a little Nipa shack. Okay, let me... Okay. Where'd you find the chair? Uh, my mother found two of her chairs, dining room chairs, in a little Nipa shack. Now what's a Nipa shack? Well, it's a little house that uh, uh, Filipinos um, live in. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother was just driving along. Uh, well, you know, we had a chauffeur out there help us cheap out there that uh, it didn't pay to drive, especially in the traffic. So anyway, um, my mother was just going down this little street and told the driver to stop. And she said, I think I see my chair. So she went in there and she says, you have two of my dining room chairs. She said, well, she said that they might have been your chairs at one time, but they're mine now. So she had to buy them <laughs> from her. Where did your parents get the, the dining room suit originally? They had the maid in Manila. And you say this is the this is the table that MacArthur sat at? Well, this is one of the chairs, yeah. yeah so that, that was he sat at the table. Did he come to your house often? No, no. He was there. Uh, he was there after my mother bought the chair back, <laughs> and I was in the states at that time. I was married. Did you ever meet MacArthur? Yes, I remember MacArthur when I was a little girl, and uh, at Manila Hotel, and there were people that would come in uh, to Manila on the ships, and and my parents that my parents would entertain. And I would um, sit down there in the lobby when my folks would go up to the room and to get them. And, and McGarza would be coming down, and he had these beautiful white sharks and suits on. And uh, he was just the most handsome-looking man. And I'm talking at a very young age. And I was so fascinated with him. I thought he was the best-looking man. But I was just to think, was not that strange? His manicured fingernails, you know, a little clear polish on Back in those days, not many people did that, but I thought, well, that's strange. <laughs> but, oh, I just thought he was so good looking. And then I, and then General um, Courtney Whitney, who was his aide, was a very good friend of ours. He and his wife and his son was a very good friend of my older brothers. Did you meet Mrs. Wainwright? No. I have a story about her. Is that right? At um, Fort Clark, Texas. Where General Clark was commanding 5th Cav before he went to the Philippines. And I interviewed a man that was sent over to help the Wainwrights move in. My goodness. And uh, he was there, and this lady was there scrubbing the floors. And uh, so he came in and just got on his knees and everything and just started talking to her. And uh, he was complaining about how he had to come over to work with, help move the general in. And um, he said, you know, Mrs. Wainwright's going to be here soon. And she said, yes. And he said, what's your name? And she said, Mrs. Wainwright. Oh, no. <laughs> and he never said a word. Oh, that's interesting. And she never said a word either. She was on her 
He said he never expected the gentleman's wife to be on her hands and knees scrubbing the floor. That's funny. Yeah. Well, gosh. Well, I can remember when Eisenhower was out there, too. He was just a major, and his son went to school out there. He did. The fact is, the, his, the daughter-in-law also was out there. Her father was stationed out there. I'd like to get some of your ideas about what you think of your experiences now, being in Santa Tomas and Los Banos. What, what you learned from the experience, how you feel about it now, just your reflections on it. Well, I wished I hadn't gone through it. That's for sure. But since I have, um, well, so many people will say, oh, well, you're so interesting to talk to. Well, there are lots of times I don't say a word about any of my past. But, you know, when people start asking me where I'm from, um, I got to the point I was tired of saying where I was from. I mean, somebody was to say California, and that, that never worked out. But, so when they'd ask me about where I was from, then they would say, how long did you live there? Then I, they would know, figure it out that I was there during the war, then they start asking questions. Now, I will say it was a very interesting experience to have gone through. I wouldn't care to go through it again. And I'm certainly glad my children didn't have to go through it. Does it bother you to talk about it today? No, not really. Now, occasionally, yes. There are a few things that sometimes bother me, but I guess I've talked about it so much that it, it doesn't. We, have we not covered any thing to stand out in your mind from the prison camp? Well, Did I'll probably think about it sometime during the night. Yeah. <laughs> but I, if you wanted to shut that off a minute, I wanted to get something and show it to you. Yeah, please. Okay, am I in focus? Yes, ma'am. Well, I was going to show you these these spoons. Um, before the war, there was this uh, elderly woman whose husband died. And uh, she was going back to uh, the United States, and she said uh, she would like to give me a dozen of her teaspoons. She had had them for 50 years. And she said, I want you to put them in your hope chest. Well, I treasured these. And when the Japanese came to the house and said, would you pack your bag for three days? I grabbed six of these spoons and put them in my bag, thinking that, well, maybe we might need them to eat with or something. So anyway, I never used them. But when the troops came in to Las Banas to get us out, I didn't have any clothes to take. So I left the spoons in my bag in my suitcase. A year later, when my mother went out there to live, she went up to the area uh, to Las Banas, and she went to the spot where our our barracks was. Lo and behold, she's just walking around trying to figure our room. There were my spoons, all stacked up. There's six of them here, all stacked up. And the fire had all twirled them all around, and and uh, anyway, she wrote and told me she found my spoons, and I never did see my spoons till my mother died, and my younger brother was going through her things, and said he, he said I'm sending you something, will you know what this is? Well, right away I knew because I remember the little flowers on it, and the old English C for coal on the back. Now, so. I think it's so interesting, I just let it sit out on the yeah. table. Mm -hmm. That is. That's I mean, it's a really uh, cherish yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. Where did you meet your husband? I met my husband in, um, did you say when or where? Both. Both, okay. Uh, after our release, uh, it was in March, early March, I would say. Uh, at Montalupe, he was in the 1st Cavalry. He was in 45, March of 45? Yes. He was in the 1st Cavalry. Uh, would be the 5th? The 5th Cavalry? Well, I mean, is it the regiment or...? Well, it would be the 5th Cavalry Regiment. There's okay. the 
because I remember fifth. Right, okay. Okay, but anyway, he was uh, in rest camp just outside of Montalupin. The, there were a bunch of fellas there, and they had, they called, uh, they came over and they asked if they could have a party at our ha at, uh, at the at the uh, prison for us, and they were going to bring the first cavalry band. And they said that they would like to uh, uh, wanted to ask all the girls that were available that the guys needed to see some white girls. I'm <laughs> <laughs> for a while. And so anyway, uh, I was invited to go to this party. And uh, the group asked me to get up and play the accordion with the band. So that's where I really impressed my husband, playing for a polka. But anyway, I was dating, at that time, was dating a captain over my husband. He was a lieutenant, first lieutenant then. And so anyway, um, that's where I met him. I used to always say during the war that I, wa I wanted to come inland. I always said Missouri, but uh, I'm in Oklahoma because I wanted it to be inland so it would take them a while to find me next war. Now the world's become so small they'll find me anyway. Right. When did you get married? In uh, February um, 23rd, 1946. One year after you were and when did you move to Oklahoma? That was when I moved here. So is your husband from Oklahoma? Yes. Okay. And what, what was his name? Paul Kelly. Paul, Paul Kelly. J. Kelly. Was he from Oklahoma City? Yes. Did he ever talk about being in the flying column, going to Santo Tomas? I thought he did, because he got a citation for going into Santo Tomas. He did? I know that. You still have the citation? I think I do. I think my son has it. Mm -hmm. Anything that we haven't covered? I was just trying to remember. I was going to ask about your early schools in Manila, your education. Well, I went to two schools. I went to Central School and then the American School. And you said you graduated from high school in Santa Tomas. Right, in Santa Tomas. Did you have a regular commencement exercise? No. <laughs> no. No, I don't have a diploma. No, I do, they just gave me a sheet of paper, and I don't even have that because it was burned. In fact, it was very hard to even get into college uh, without any, you know, records. Where'd you go to college? Oh, I just went to short time University of California, and I dropped out to get married. I wished I'd continued on, but, you know. Have you received any benefits? Besides the dollar a day that you received no. as being a, an attorney? No. Why? Any idea? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, my parents got some money back on war claims, but didn't begin to compare what they lost. But no, we never got any benefits. Mm -hmm. I think if we had been military, yes, we would have. Would you consider that your family was in the, I'll say, upper class, for lack of a better term, in the middle, before the war? Well, I would say probably so. You know, my you were comfortable. Upper, there. Yeah, comfortable. Yeah. yeah, right. What was the reaction to Filipinos to your being taken prisoner? Well, they were very upset about it. They they really were because they were still pro-Americans then. Yes, they would do anything in the world they, they could for us. Were there many Filipinos that worked with Japanese? Yes, later. Mm -hmm. Later. You know, although I would say majority of the Filipinos were more on the American side. I would say 80% of them were. They would do anything they could do.
to help the American out. I'm sure you've heard that from others too, haven't you? Yes, ma'am. In fact, uh, Judge Barry said that when they were being taken to prison at Corregidor, mm -hmm. the Filipinos lined up and they were crying in the streets. Oh, sure. That's did you, right. Did you see much of this? Uh, we were taken on the trucks. Okay. So we went too fast. Yeah. Oh, I know. Well, you know, there were just too many people that we all knew out there that worked for, you know, for us that, you know, that they were bound to be upset. I know when my uncle came back from the war, he was in the, the Pacific. He brought back a lot of the uh, Japanese pesos. Oh, yes. The Japanese government. Mm -hmm. We called it Mickey Mouse yeah. <laughs> money. <laughs> that was one thing we couldn't, we weren't supposed to have any money. You weren't? No, particularly Filipino pesos. They were supposed to be all turned in. Were you issued any Japanese pesos? Yes. We were supposed to turn in what we had in Philippine pesos. There again, that was the beginning part of the war where, you know, they would let us get a little in, they'd smuggle money into us. But, you know, eventually people ran out. Oh, I was going to ask. Uh, at the end, you said you were trading jewelry for food. That's right. You were trading it for who? The Japanese? Japanese guards. Uh, for my watch, I got uh, two packages of cigarettes and one package of chewing tobacco. <laughs> and I've never smoked a day in my life. So anyway, I was able to sell that. My chewing tobacco sold for $80. I got a check for $80. The man wanted it so badly. So you took a check? I took a check, and he legally would not have had to honor my check. He could have stopped payment on it. But he put manager, general manager of this paint company, and you know, the paint company made him honor it. So I got $80 out of it, which was a lot of money back then, sure. you know, but a lot of money for a package of chewing tobacco. <laughs> but you know, it's things like a can of corned beef was going for $70. But, you know, people, I don't know how they got checks in. Well, some people were better organized, I guess. What about the cigarettes? Oh, well, we didn't have cigarettes. I mean, the two, the packages. Oh, the two, two packages. Well, I tell you what. Um, I guess I sort of bribed a few people with those, you know. One, including my younger brother. <laughs> Get him to do a few things for me. And he shouldn't have been smoking, but he wanted to try it. Besides having the floor shows and you playing the accordion, what else would you do to pass the time? Oh, we'd sing. We, at the beginning, they'd allow us to have a little dance or something, you know. Uh, but, I mean, I was not, when I say a dance, it wasn't really a dance. It wasn't much of anything. Oh, we, we would play, oh, we'd play baseball for instance, basketball. We did things like that. What else would you do for recreation? Well, that's about it. That's about it. Exercise. So for three years, that's what you did. That's right. No, we didn't have much of anything else. I mean, they people weren't jogging back in those days. <laughs> we didn't have anything to jog with. I was wearing wooden slippers. You know, the Filipino shoes, we call them bakyas. Of course, you were climbing three flights of stairs. That's right, right. You betcha. Uh, particularly having to carry a wooden slat bed down once a week and putting it out in the sun, pouring hot water on to kill bed bugs. I was going to ask if they were a problem. Oh, they were awful. I mean, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd be all chewed up. We had mosquito nets, fortunately. But the bed bugs were awful. What about body lice? Yeah, they have body lice. I fortunately never got that. Yes, it was. Because, you know, it's so hot out there. And, 
We have things like tropical ulcers. My younger brother had a tropical ulcer that was so bad that it was many, many months after the war before that thing ever healed, and it ended up, it looked like he had a big shrapnel wound. What's the tropical ulcer? Well, it's like a big boil, only it eats in. Is that what they call a jungle rot? They kind of like a jungle rot. Because I got that in did you? Station. Oh, gee. Yeah. Yes, my husband had that over uh, in New Guinea. I know what it is. Mm -hmm. Well, this is just a great big sore. It was right on the shin. Well, he had an awful scar from that. I just had a small one on my foot. Did you? Yeah, and the doctors part that right off, and they caught it when it was still well, small. Well, that's good. Because so my husband had that around his eye yeah. in New Guinea. Well, we've talked for almost an hour and a half. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I can't believe that. I think we have a good And interview. And we are, as I said, we are having our reunion now. The 7th to the 11th in Las Vegas. Of which month? Of next year, February. February. It's going to be at the Sahara Hotel. Now this is Santa well, if you want Santa Tomas Los Banos mm -hmm, prison camp reunion, and we're invited the first cavalry in, and the um, um, you know Eleventh Airborne group. Have you contacted the first cab at Fort Hood? No, I don't. I didn't know how to. Okay, that I is don't. that is where the active division is now, Fort Hood. Okay, but that is also where the first cab association is. That's all the okay. former first cab members. Uh, if you'll give me the address, sure. all right. I don't have it on me, but, no, but uh, I'm back saying when if I you bring will. that book over okay. this afternoon, I'll bring the address. Okay. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, because I'll go ahead and write them, just and tell them, just in case they don't know about it, you know, because they only have one person that's going to be there so far. And I think if it was put in the paper, some of those fellows might really enjoy that. Yeah. Do you have any connection at all with uh, what prison was Judge Barry in? He was in uh, Bellabed Prison, yes, yes, not very far from my camp, from Santa Tomas. I could see the tower from Santa Tomas. He showed me the picture that you gave him. Did he? Oh, yeah. I have one hanging in my hallway. Well, I want to thank you very much for the interview. Well, you're welcome. I appreciate this. Well, I'm glad to help you out. It'll be interesting to see how it turns out. Good. And this is Joe Todd, an interview with Patsy Croft Kelly. It's Patty. Kelly. Patty, I'm sorry, Patty Croft Kelly. Thank you.